Hello everyone, and welcome to my General Hospital official channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. When Avery disappears, Sunny and Ava get distraught. Brooke Lynn visited Maxie's office at Deception while eating lunch. Although Maxie was taken aback to see Brooke Lynn working on her day off, she was thankful for the lunch because she had been overloaded with work when her assistant abruptly left. According to Brooke Lynn, she had wished to assist with social media. Maxie launched an application on her computer to display a list of the things that Deception sold while they talked about the popularity of Deceptor. However, the topic changed when Maxie revealed that she had made the decision to seek for a house. Why it took so long piqued Brooke Lynn's interest. Because of Nathan, Maxie responded. Because it was where she first met Nathan, fell in love with him, and formed a family with him. Maxie noted that her apartment was filled with important memories. Maxie and Nina had also organized Nathan's funeral there. Brooke Lynn reassured Maxie that she didn't have to leave the apartment if she wasn't ready. But Brooke Lynn suggested that change could be good. Maxie was confident that she would make new memories with her children in their new home. But she was afraid to let go of her apartment because it had become her emotional support blanket. Maxie agreed and gave Brooke Lynn's friendship as an illustration of a good transition. Maxie stated that Brooke Lynn treated Bailey like a second mother and Maxie had complete faith in Brooke Lynn. You should really not, Brooke Lynn advised. Brooke Lynn acknowledged that she wasn't perfect. Maxie was about to reply when her phone rang. Maxie hung up the phone after a brief conversation and went to the distribution department to address a problem. Brooke Lynn downloaded the Deceptor file after Maxie left by connecting a flash drive to the computer. Brooke Lynn had left when Maxie went back to her office a little while later. Maxie called Brooke Lynn's assistant to inquire as to her whereabouts. But the assistant informed Maxie that Brooke Lynn hadn't been seen all day. Tracy texted Brooke Lynn from the quarter main kitchen, asking her to let her know when she had discovered something in Maxie's office. Dante, Sam, and Scout arrived a short while later. Scout approached her Aunt Tracy and gave her a warm hug. Tracy advised Scout that Cody might be in the stables because Olivia had brought Leo to the park. They weren't there to see Olivia or Cody, according to Dante. Drew entered just then and told Tracy that his daughter had come to visit him. Drew asked Scout to show Dante the new blooms in Monica's garden after the two of them hugged. Sam's apology to Drew for missing his hearing made Tracy know something wasn't right. Drew informed Tracy of Judge Kim's decision to reject his plea bargain and give him a three-year prison term in Pentonville. Tracy was indignant and insisted that there had been an injustice committed. Tracy was aware of the conflicts she and Drew had experienced, but she was confident that her brother Alan was writhing in his grave. She pleaded with Drew to modify his position and blame Carly, but Drew wouldn't budge. Sam agreed with Tracy, which surprised Tracy. Drew argued that things turned out for the better. Tracy questioned, for whom? For Carly, not for your daughter. Drew maintained that Scout lived with Dante and Sam in a devoted and secure environment. Drew was adamant that taking the blame would benefit the most people, but Sam disagreed feeling that Drew shouldn't be made into a sacrificial lamb for the greater good. Sam, nobody ever said that life was fair, Drew said. Drew remarked that he had breached the law and had to deal with the repercussions, notwithstanding Tracy's argument that being the sacrificed lamb was an exaggerated virtue. Sam questioned, what about the consequences for Carly? Scout and Dante arrived back just then, when Scout overheard her parents arguing. She inquired as to why. Scout was instantly reassured by Drew and Sam that they were afraid, not angry. Drew and Sam sat Scout down and gently informed her that Drew had to report to jail as Dante and Tracy watched. Scout asked if she could visit Drew after remembering visiting Sam in prison earlier in her life. Sam agreed to take Scout to see Drew every weekend. Brooke Lynn arrived home after Tracy asked Scout to show her the garden. Brooke Lynn was incredibly sorry for Drew. 
If Drew encountered difficulties at Pentonville, Dante pledged to assist. Dante was thanked by Drew, and he begged him to stay at Scout's side. Later, Tracy entered the room while Brooke Lynn was sat in the kitchen. The flash disk with all the confidential material on Deceptor since it was first mentioned the previous fall was handed over by Brooke Tracy's Lynn to her grandmother placed right her away. initial joy. Tracy remarked, That's a lot sooner than we imagined. If Tracy had been collaborating with anyone else to bring down deception, Brooke Lynn demanded to know. Tracy counseled Brooke Lynn to obey directions and refrain from posing inquiries. Tracy said, or else. Martin invited Lucy to join him in the pool at Metro Court, but Lucy turned him down. Lucy perked up when she saw Mac and Felicia enter, and Martin acknowledged that he had a feeling that something was on her mind. Mac welcomed Lucy's friends and said that they had decided on the spur of the moment to spend the day at the pool. Lucy requested Martin buy her a pia colada after Felicia dispatched Mac to get one for her. Lucy immediately emptied her glass after Martin noticed that she hadn't finished her first one. When Lucy and Felicia were alone, Felicia questioned Lucy's motivation for wanting to meet. Martin has been acting strangely ever since they left the safe home, according to Lucy. Martin's tendency of leaving calls on voicemail without leaving a message, the mysterious manner he conducted business, and his inability to claim any credit for helping Lucy come up with Deceptor were all things Lucy told Felicia about. Felicia noted that since Lucy had already done all the legwork, Martin might not want to steal the show from her. Even though Lucy acknowledged the possibility, she was certain that something was very fishy. Lucy stated that she wanted Felicia to learn what Martin was hiding when Felicia asked if she wanted her to spy on Martin. Lucy wished it had been a large nothing burger. Martin and Mac meanwhile sat back in their recliners with their drinks. When Martin saw how physically fit and toned Mac was, he decided against taking off his shirt. Martin stated that Lucy wanted to reproduce the same marital dynamic that she had with Mac and Felicia during her marriage to Kevin, and Mac thought that Lucy was trying to force Martin and him into being fast friends. Mac acknowledged that the four of them had a great time. Martin began to inquire about the breakup of Lucy and Kevin, but Mac started chuckling as Martin portrayed Lucy as a compassionate and understanding person. Lucy could be understanding, according to Mac, unless someone calls her foolish, manipulable, or lacking in self-advocacy. Martin thought back to the text message his third ex-wife had sent him, warning him that avoiding her was a grave mistake. As Jocelyn returned from the pool, Carly welcomed her in the kitchen. Jocelyn explained to Carly that Trent had obligations and that she had also wanted to check on Carly because she knew she should have spent the day with Dex and Trina. Jocelyn didn't believe Carly when she told her that she was all right because Drew had already received a three-year term at Pentonville. The judgment of the judge astounded Jocelyn. Jocelyn stated that Drew was a veteran Navy SEAL who had assisted in saving numerous people from Victor's lethal plan. While Carly countered that Judge Kim had recognized an opportunity to be tough on a privileged defendant. Carly explained to Jocelyn that the judge didn't want the public to believe that Drew could get away with a white-collar crime because of a few heroic deeds, but Jocelyn insisted that three years in prison was too much. Jocelyn inquired as to her mother's remorse after Carly informed her that Jocelyn thought it had been a grave error on her part to not report Sunny. It was a line that Carly said she would never cross. When Jocelyn revealed to her mother that she had changed her mind about Sunny, her mother was shocked. She credited Carly with assisting her in realizing that she had lost her bearings because Jocelyn had been too preoccupied with defending Carly and shielding Dex. Although Jocelyn acknowledged she hadn't entirely forgotten Sunny's wrongs, she had been able to control her rage for the benefit of her sisters. Jocelyn felt it was unfair for Drew to face three years in prison while Sunny, who had committed numerous crimes, was allowed to roam free. Sam and Scout both had Jocelyn's sympathy. But Carly reassured her that Drew's counsel had submitted an appeal. Later, Diane came into the kitchen and gave Carly's the wonderful accounts news would be unfrozen carrying. the next day, according to Diane. Shortly after Diane delivered Carly a copy of the plea bargain, 
which detailed Carly's punishment, Carly felt some comfort. Carly was surprised to learn that the $5 million fine would completely deplete her funds. Carly was given support from Jocelyn using her trust fund, but she declined. When Jocelyn proposed that Carly seek assistance from Michael or Sonny, Diane cautioned Carly against doing so because the SEC would examine both Carly and Sonny's financial records. Diane also cautioned Carly that although Michael had managed to avoid this SEC's attention, if he paid Carly's fine, that might change. Despite the astronomical penalties, Diane reassured Carly that it was still a fantastic deal. Jocelyn questioned Carly about her plans after Diane went to complete the paperwork with the feds. Carly gave her kid the reassurance that she would resolve the situation. Jocelyn was reminded by Carly that Carly had experienced what it was like to start from nothing and work her way up. I am Carly Spencer, and I will recover all that I lost, Carly declared. Jocelyn had her mother's word. Carly acknowledged that she might be getting the shaft from the world, but she decided to kick back ten times harder. Soon after, Drew showed up. Jocelyn left after giving Drew a hug so that Drew and Carly could have some alone. Drew acknowledged that he had been anticipating seeing her, but that everything was moving too quickly. In a melancholy voice, Carly stated, This is where we say goodbye. Ava shouted urgently for Avery in the park. Ava informed Chase that Avery had been abducted when he arrived at the scene, flanked by two police officers. Pilar, when questioned by Chase, stated that she had only momentarily turned her back before Avery fled. Ava encouraged Chase to take further action because she understood that the first 24 hours were crucial. Chase asked a police officer to collect Pillar's statement. Ava disputed Chase's assertion that Avery had merely gone off. Ava declared, I have every reason in the world to think someone kidnapped her. Chase questioned Ava about her certainty that Avery had been kidnapped. Avery might be used by Mason to coerce Ava's obedience. Austin had warned her during their chat in his office. Ava dismissed the memory. Chase was reminded by her that Sonny was the father of Avery and that he had far too many foes to count. Chase decided to post a missing child warning after realizing that Ava had a point. When Ava reached for her phone, she dialed Sonny. When Eddie arrived at Sonny's penthouse, he was angry that Sonny had sent Dex after him and claimed that Dex had mistreated him. Eddie was reassured by Nina that no harm was meant, although Sonny had been worried. Eddie stated that he was not anyone's concern and that he needed to catch a train. You won't be leaving, Sonny said, as Eddie acknowledged doing some research on Sonny. He inquired as to if Sonny intended to break his legs if he refused to stay in town and please Olivia. The information that Eddie learned about Sonny and Olivia's shared child was also disclosed. Sonny said that was real, and he would go a long way for Olivia. Nina's face grew worried, but she didn't say anything. Sonny admitted that some of the rumors about Eddie were accurate, but said that Olivia would want him to stay intact. On that note, Sonny added, I'm going to make you an offer you can't turn down. Sonny indicated that in exchange for Eddie staying in Port Charles, he would introduce Eddie to every music venue, radio station, and boutique record company in the area through his contacts. While Eddie was tempted, Nina didn't appear to be pleased with the offer. Eddie inquired as to how he could be confident that the record company he joined with would give his songs first priority. Sonny pledged to make it happen. Sonny's phone rang, cutting off the chat. Sonny quickly left the room after speaking with Ava for a short while. Soon after, Sonny showed up to the park. Sonny was preoccupied with tracking down Avery when Peeler started to apologize to him. Chase cautioned Sonny that his presence would escalate the situation if other elements were involved after Sonny instructed I'm a Frank father first to right now, Sonny stated. Sonny made the decision to call Dante after Chase left, but Ava interrupted him and said Sonny needed to know something. Austin questioned, You all looking for someone? Everyone turned as Austin and Avery, who was carrying a pink balloon, approached. Sonny and Ava hurried over to their daughter relieved. Austin revealed that while out on a run, he had noticed Avery by himself near the pond. 
Avery explained that she had gone off in quest of balloons when she had noticed a quantity floating in the air. Ava's eyes narrowed in suspicion. Austin stated once more that he had been worried about Avery being alone, and he felt lucky that she had recognized him. Sonny was concentrating on Avery as he strongly warned his daughter that she was never to run off again as Ava stared at Austin. Yes, Daddy, Avery responded. Peeler was cautioned by Sonny not to ever again turn her back on his kids as he approached her. Avery vanished during the little time that Peeler was on the phone with a telemarketer using her grandmother's number as the caller ID Peeler claimed. Sonny made the decision to take Avery home when Ava and Avery approached. When Ava was through with the cops, he encouraged her to drop by the penthouse. Peeler began to apologize as Sonny departed. But Ava interrupted her and said they would talk the next day. Chase suggested driving Peeler home. Ava struck Austin across the face as soon as Chase and Pilar walked away. Ava exclaimed, You son of a bitch, you set this whole thing up, didn't you? Nana announced the discovery of Avery in the penthouse. Eddie expressed his happiness for Sonny and Nina, but admitted he had never been interested in having children since they were too much work. Although Eddie insisted that he needed time and space to pursue his passion for music, Nina reassured him that having children gave life significance. Nina skillfully directed the discussion to Sonny's proposal. She gave off the impression that she was delighted for Eddie, but she said that he would be a big fish in a really small pond. Nina said that Eddie would be free to concentrate on his music rather than fretting about touring, gaining a national following, and pursuing fame, glory, and recognition. Eddie, is it not what you want? Nina questioned. She had certainly given Eddie a lot to think about, he acknowledged. Soon after, Sonny and Avery arrived at their house. Avery was welcomed cordially by Nina and was led into the kitchen. Eddie admitted to Sonny that despite his hesitations, he had chosen to accept Sonny's offer. Eddie and Sonny shook hands.